I think it's the same problem from either side, right? Whether you're whether you're yes. a, a pubco or an MSO or you're a legacy operator that's struggling, it's operational error from two different angles, right? From the pubco side, you've got people who are executively managing the business. They never even kept a house plant alive. They can't. They can't even. They can't even tell when something needs water, right? right. Okay. Straight brown thumb. <laughs> uh, okay. Right. The other, the opposite side of that is dude can run his 16 lighter and grow chalice winning pot, but right. doesn't know how to use Excel. Mikey Towie, how we doing, buddy? Good, Ben. How are you, man? I'm doing well. Nice to uh, chat before the holiday weekend. Can't believe I caught you on 4th of July weekend. Yeah, well, when you have kids, come much less of a party animal. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were just chatting, and you're 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 really dealing with it right now with your AC going out, huh? Yep, the universe likes to screw with me. Move me out of California, where the weather's always temperate. Move me to a place where it's either freezing cold or super hot and humid. You know? Oh my gosh, dude! Yeah, that's it's it's when I. I lived in central California, uh, for quite a while. And, you know, there's, there's like probably I knew of seven or eight indoor cannabis businesses that just didn't have to have HVAC. They just didn't have cooling That's because crazy, yeah. it was just, it was just 74, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, all the time. And so yeah. it just, they just moved the air in from, it's like, a literally it was just, loop. it was just coming in, you know, through yeah. like a carbon filter, basically they weren't the nicest grows, but they weren't the most sophisticated grows, but <laughs> you know, they grew killer pot. So that's all that really matters. <laughs> that's awesome. Why don't we just start off with kind of a quick background of you and what you've been up to up to this point? Absolutely, man. Um, you know, so I've been a commercial cultivator for gosh, coming up on I think this is year nine, almost year 10, um, was lucky enough to start in Washington state, um, which was the second state to get legalized, I think 2014, uh, which is insane to think about how long it's already been. Yeah, right. Um, and it feels, it feels just like yesterday. And I still feel like I'm constantly learning and trying to expand. And, um, you know, really before that I was, I was in school, I went to school for music. Um, I have a degree in uh, percussion performance and, uh, was a musician, uh, all through high school and, you know, had a big passion for that. Uh, but also cannabis was right there, you know, on, on the side, I, I, the story I always tell is, um, you know, I, I started selling weed before I ever started smoking it. Uh, and I'll never forget going to like a high school party, like my freshman year, you know, like an upperclassman party. You know? oh, yeah. I was, a, I was a sober Sally for, you know, most of my high school. Cause I played serious sports and soccer and, you know, didn't want to, you know, straight edge. We used to call yeah. it back in the day, you know? Um, and I've never forget, I'm still friends with this guy, but I watched him get like six or seven kids to go five bucks each on a blunt. And then I watched him weigh it out and it was like, it was like 1.5 grams. <laughs> I started doing the math, you know, I carried the one. I was like, wait a second here. And I think I, uh, I had an older brother at the time and I think I went to his boy and I bought like three or four ounces and flipped it in like four or five days. And I was just like, oh my gosh, you know, and as a broke yeah. high school kid uh, that didn't, you know, come from a family with a lot being able to earn and make my own money like that. I mean, it was just, it was just game changing. Also a little addictive, but uh, you know, I ended up going to school for music and during that time was trapping and doing the whole thing. Like many of us, you know, uh, music and cannabis. I'm so surprised <laughs> that doesn't, seem yeah, right. <laughs> you know, um, but I was lucky enough to, I also, you know, I, I, I really wanted to play at a high level. Um, and so, you know, I was going to one of the better schools of music in the Northwest at that time, um, you know, was subbing for professional symphonies. And that's really what I thought I was going to do. Um, and, and being, you know, and playing at a high level like that, it requires a lot of the same disciplines that I think are required to be good at anything. And that's, that's mm -hmm. literally what I did, right. As being a musician was, was you, you, you become a professional at being terrible at something, right. And then just slowly getting better at it over time. Yeah. Um, and that's what I got good at was understanding how to be in a practice room, understanding how to, you know, bring something in that I've never seen before, break it down into its chunks and its pieces, start to learn it over time and then rebuild that back up. Um, and, and, would you say it's kind of a combination of uh, discipline of mastery, but also maybe a humility uh, of realizing that you're not really ever a master? Dude, I that's I love the way you say that, right? Because I think there's uh, the humility aspect is is critical of it, right? Understanding and being okay 
with not being good at something all the time, right? right? And knowing that that it's a temporary problem, right? It doesn't have to be forever. And right. and understanding what you have control of as an individual to affect that change in your life, you know? And that's what I really think music taught me um, was, was how to overcome, right? And a lot of that's fear-based performance anxiety was a big thing I had to deal with a lot, you know, being able, you know, doing solo recitals, right. An hour, hour and a half of memorized material, you know, don't get to yeah. look at a piece of music and then you're performing it for two or 300 of your family members or your peers. Right. Um, and that's a lot of pressure and it takes months to put that stuff together. And then you just go and you perform it and then you're done. You know, it's yeah. very kind of like, you know, it, it's very kind of, uh, 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 Zen in that, my, in that way of like the, you end up spending so much time for something that might last only a few minutes, you know, and then you have to do it all over again. Right. It's like a Disneyland I, ride. <laughs> dude. <laughs> It really is. And I, it ended up, I think, purport, preparing me really, really well for cannabis and that adventure. Yeah. Right. And because, I mean, this is what it is. It's it's every, you know, it's cannabis is a 12 or 16 week, 18 week cycle. Right. And you sprints and repeat and you get another shot to correct your mistakes, to make sure that you're learning and, um, and, and going from, you know, a, a base zero to something completed something that is, you know, sellable, that's safe, right? Um, that's good for a consumer. So, you know, anyway, I was getting out of school and instead of going and pursuing more education, I had an opportunity to work on, I think it was the second licensed facility in Washington state at that time. And, it, and I was also very lucky. It was conveniently like 30 or 40 minutes outside of where I had just graduated. Mm -hmm. And, um, Honestly, man, you know, through trapping and 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 selling weed, I I, I definitely had some run-ins with the law. Um, you know, had some issues. You know, I've had a couple of horror stories of 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 being robbed. Um, <laughs> do you hear my <laughs> hear my uh, compatriot in here? Um, oh. <laughs> uh, and then and 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 really, I just I was so tired of having to look over my shoulder, you know, and have yeah. that fear. And so, you know, did yeah, did we? all take huge pay cuts to come in and work in the legal space but yes but did it offer a ton of you know safety and security yeah. also yes so um right. it's a trade-off for sure yeah dude and that was that was 2014 and it was a 30,000 square foot license that we built out and i think we cropped like over 5,000 pounds that first season i had no idea what wow. i was doing you know it was a starting point for sure yeah i mean it was like 18 of us kids I mean, it was, it was, we were HR, we were security GC, right. um, you know, I mean, I had done some and house. figuring it all out by yourself because there oh. wasn't really any direction and, and no one knew how much this stuff was going to cost yet. Right. Everybody had ballparks based off of like the Quack. fucking 16 lighters that they put up in their garage, but right. no one had come and like, Oh, we need, I need to build a head house. I need to build a post-processing space where I can right. house 25 full-time employees oh we need bathrooms <laughs> like wait a second they can't just go piss outside of the right. garage you know so right. um it was i mean it was just all it was just such a steep learning curve but dude i just fell in love with the process um and i think you know you can really appreciate this as well i i just the reward you get you know when you've when you've built that and then you plant those plants for the first time and you're there every day watering them and you're there the whole weekend making sure that the greenhouse doesn't get too hot and kill the plants and like you know you spend you spend 70 80 hours 90 hours of your week and then you finally crop these plants and then we were we sold the second licensed bag of weed basically hmm. in in the state of Washington and wow. um it feels pretty cool to be able to be a part of that, you know, and you know, all, all it was then was extremely stressful and crazy, right. you know, um, and time consuming. But, um, you know, now it's like, I only think of it fondly, which is so funny to say. Yeah. Time always makes things that were horrible feel a lot better. I think, you know, <laughs> it's you remember the more of the good stuff and you like kind of forget some of the bad stuff and reframe some of that bad stuff as you realize what that impact has on you moving forward, I think. Yeah, I think so too, man. And, and um, I mean, you and I have talked about this in the past, right? Where there are, you know, cannabis, I think is one of the best industries to create opportunities for people. Uh, yeah. And that, and I, I mean, it's just a general term because there's so many different versions of that. What I yeah. think the challenge is, is as individuals is how do you, 
how do you decipher, you know, how do you, how do you understand which opportunities are the right ones? Um, and how do you like de-risk that for yourself? Right. Hmm. Um, and I think that's, I think that's been a big one is, is being able to understand quickly and identify, you know, who are legitimate businesses, who are legitimate actors, you know, who are people who want to be in this space for the long term, um, and making sure that you're aligning yourself with those people and the type of people who have the right principles for this space. That's for I want to definitely come back to that for sure and, and dig more into that. So tell me a little bit more about uh, kind of after the Washington gig. So Washington uh, did the first one in Washington, and then I uh, went over and was headhunted to Northwest Cannabis Solutions, which I still I'd have to check I five hundred two data, but they they and Fat, Fat Panda basically go back and forth okay. as being the uh, number one producer processor in Washington State, um, and that was a beautiful. This is where I think I really cut my teeth on commercial cultivation. This was a, a state of the art thirty thousand square foot indoor facility, um, and I mean we went hard in there. So you know traditionally you know a thousand watt double ended uh, uh, a Kavita bulb, um, you know, mm -hmm. fixture is going to be placed over a four by four spacing. Right. So we were, we were doing that lighting over a two by two spacing. Oh man, you're um, doubling up, doubling up, ton of light, ton of HVAC. It was a really unique design. It's still one of my favorite designs to this day, but, um, when money old, is no object, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, I mean, it was just, it's, but it was an old Lay's warehouse. And so it had two mezzanines on it and we basically okay. turned it into a giant self storage. So there was, you mm -hmm. know, 10 foot roll up doors. And mm -hmm. what we did was we got prefabbed plastic containers that were on steel casters and they were various sizes. They would hold four or six plants a piece. And then you would wheel them into this room. The only thing in the room was lights, fans, HVAC, right? You couldn't actually work on the plants in the room, but we had that big open mezzanine space and we hung oh, okay, good, sets good, good. of lights down. And so you could pull so you can move it out room. to do the work on it. Yeah, Literally. And dude, it was huh. so sweet. Cause you could, I like love how that, I, I love how that state of the art back then. That's awesome. <laughs> Dude, I mean, and, and, uh, I mean the lighting, the HVAC, the control systems that they had, I mean, I, I had no, I had never, I had not seen a facility this size that had this yeah. much technology in it, you know? Yeah. Um, and we would do, we, we, I got in there and I mean, I, it was, it was like being able to drive a Ferrari on a track, you know, for the right, first right, time. Right. It was so fun. Um, when I first started, I think we were doing 750, 800 pounds a month. And then after about six or seven months, we got that up to like 1500, 1600, oh, wow. which is a pretty good clip for a 30,000 square foot facility. Um, yeah. but you know, at GDF, it's like, you know, we're kind of rewriting that book. You know, we have 30,000 square foot facilities that, are putting up 2,200, 2,300 pounds of flour and pop, not just biomass a month right now. Wow. So, um, you know, the, the, it, again, it's like, it's, it's understanding how to take these facilities and what to do from a science perspective. So crushed NWCS for like a year and then, um, ended up getting headhunted down to Cali by one of my longtime friends and mentors. You might've actually met him. Do you know, Paul Henderson He's the CEO of high times. I don't know him personally. You know, he's a no. great guy. If you, if you ever wanted to chat with him, I'd love to connect you guys. He's awesome. Um, yeah, he and I have been, he and I have been um, friends for a long time. We were connected because at that grow at, at NWCS, I was an early adopter of LED, believed in LED technology for a long time. This is pre-fluence, um, you know, uh, pre-lux, right? This, yeah, was, this yeah. was back when BIOS fixtures was really kind of the only commercially available cannabis led um which is a great company shout out to neil yorio um and patrick campus and the boys but uh <laughs> long story short i was trying to convince you know guys to switch off of hps in 2015 yeah. which was not an easy which was oh, not i can easy. only imagine the level of pushback on that yeah i, mean, oh, I, I remember the stories back then of you know people grumbling that you're not going to get like fully formed trichomes and the weed's going to taste you know immature and blah, yeah, blah, blah, blah. all sorts of stuff yeah as if as if like horticulture hadn't been using leds for like okay, 30 right. years but it's cannabis dude it's not yeah, the same man not the same yes yeah, so, <laughs> so um uh, i got connected to paul through uh bios from doing led r d with them and paul called me because this was when this was pre low farm so this was indus all tie back in 2016 okay, yep. 2017 you remember those guys and yeah. um these guys were like hey we have Oh God, what was it? We have 25, 10,000 square foot licenses that were awarded and we're putting them all on one property in Salinas and we're doing 250,000 square feet and we need someone to come and, and run it. And I, yeah. I do. Wow. 
I was like at a lunch. I think I was, true, yeah. yeah, I was thinking I was eating lunch. I think I spat my food out. I was just like, <laughs> I was like, do you guys have any idea what you're talking about? You know, because I was like, I've just gotten do- through two years of running 30,000 square feet, which was uh, insane. And so, yeah, yeah. you know, to come in and do that, um, well, you know, 5X is just is is just something completely, it's completely different. But of course I had to take the opportunity. Like, what the fuck are we talking 100%. about? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, and this well, is it's like- that, I, It's that thing you were talking about. It's continuing to push your own professional envelope, right? Go into the situations where you're uncomfortable and, and learn as you go. I definitely see that as an opportunity. Well, and I think you will appreciate this a lot, right? Where- I have I have never known for sure that every the opportunity I was taking was the right one, and I don't sure. think you right. ever are able to yeah. right. There's a there's a, a leap of faith that you have to be willing to take, and you have to be willing to bet on yourself, and that's what that's the decision I made. I was 24 when I got that call to come down to California. I had no right to go and build a business that and and, and go and spend 70 million dollars and build a team of 300 in nine months who who am i to go and do something like that you know um but really but you say that and yet who really is anybody because that level of scale isn't really you know established yet at that point right like in cannabis so everyone's and it's like you said you're taking a leap of faith but it's even more than in other industries because everybody's a startup so then there's that whole risk of the startup as well it's not even just about Am I going to go in and, and is this going to be right for me? But is this place even going to get off the ground? Is it going to f- miserably fail? And then that's on my resume, you know, not to mention I've got to look for another opportunity. So I think there's a lot of cojones involved with taking those leaps and, and putting yourself out there into those positions. But that's also how you've gotten to where you are today, right? Dude, it's, it's so funny you say it because like how thin is the line between being like a moron and having huge nuts right it's like <laughs> it's, it's, the same thing. <laughs> it's, it's the same it's the same yeah. thing and, and i think literally it just kind of comes out to the outcome that you're a part of because i think you and i both know plenty of very smart talented individuals who have come into this space and frankly just been chewed up and spit out because they got mixed up with the wrong team or the wrong opportunity and and i mean and, and again dude like even even the ones that were right you know, they still, yeah. they still were massive challenges. We still yeah. wasted millions of dollars, you know? And, and yeah. again, like it's not any one person's fault, but it's just like, no, we didn't know. We had no right. idea. No one knew. I mean, and, but again, like, I think that's, that's the hubris of being in this industry. And I think it's what attracts these high risk individuals um, in the space is that, you know, you're going to come in and, and honestly, like, the overconfidence of some of these guys. It's like we raised 70 million. We're gonna build the we're gonna yeah, build we're the gonna spend growth. that in a minute. <laughs> yeah. I mean we're gonna build the gr- best grow in California. We're gonna have the best weed. It's premium only, you know, and it's like and now that's a small grow. That's the sad part. <laughs> There's always a bigger fish, right? Come always a bigger fish. Snap you up. Yeah, yeah. So um, so anyways, we got down there, we cranked. Um, now that is Lowell Farms, who I'm sure people are familiar with. Um, uh, right um uh, right there in Salinas, beautiful, beautiful part of California. And was felt so lucky yeah. to be able to land there as my first ex- my moving from Seattle, you know, down to to California and getting my start there, right in that Monterey area. I mean, it's yeah, just gorgeous. So beautiful. Yep. Carmel, all that good stuff. <laughs> oh my gosh, dude. 17 mile drive. Yeah, and just epic. Um now the microclimates there suck. So that was one thing right. that really pissed me off. You know, was I was you know sold. Oh yeah, you're gonna get 14 hours of sun a day. It's beautiful. You know, turns out there's actually like four hours of cloud cover every yeah, freaking exactly. day. Oh, yeah, yeah it doesn't matter what time of the year it is. Yeah. Oh, so, man. but it's a learning curve, right? And I think that's part. That's the, the again, like as someone who is you know predominantly an indoor grower and prefers indoor growing. That is, I think, still one of my favorite parts about the California and the outdoor and the greenhouse experience is is the adaptations that you have to make as a cultivator, depending on where you're at geographically in right. the state. And it could be know? even just a few miles uh, and it can make a big difference. And, and Salinas is a great example of where right. like you're close enough to the water and that's why you get that microclimate. But if you go 20 more minutes down 101 to Greenfield, it's 10 to 15 degrees hotter every day and you don't get any microclimate. Right. Yep. Um, yep. um, and you can see that too, when you drive down one-on-one, you know, from central California on your way to LA, uh, then you're going through the grapevine. It's like the, the, the landscape changes so much, the water available. Super desert. Yep. 
super desert, the crops that they're allowed to grow completely change, you know, yeah. and you don't get another set of greenhouses again until you get to like slow. Right. Or, yeah. or then Santa Barbara, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's really, it is, it's really interesting for that part of the, I think, I think Salinas has a capacity to be a predominant cannabis producer forever. Um, mm -hmm. assuming they can get their, their regs correct. Um, uh, and and people know how to build infrastructure for the long term. Um, you know, that's I think that's the biggest challenge I've seen, especially in in that part of California. Is I mean, you, you know how it is. That's greenhouse, outdoor light depth. It's the cheapest infrastructure to build. It's the quickest infrastructure to put up. It's also the lowest cost, and it also creates the lowest value flower and biomass. Right. right? So like when you see the rise, like look at what's happened in California this year with over 18 million square feet not being renewed. If you look at the diversification of that, over 75% of it is outdoor and light depth licensing because yeah, yeah. It, it's it, this shit is so expensive. You're going to come in when you're going to, nobody has money. No, nobody's getting capital in the cannabis right now, let alone the capital that it takes to come and retrofit and crush a 250,000 square foot greenhouse. The last one to do that, it's like Natura, you know? Right. Um, well, and like with everyone's obsession with the THC percentage too, that sort of puts you at a disadvantage when you have the outdoor where there's other components. I mean, I, I like outdoor, but you know, I'm not looking for 30, 35% THC. So I think when you're up against that and the advantages that you have to offer the market aren't advantages that people care about. And then on top of that, there's so much saturation in your part of the market and the price compression is almost unproportional. Uh, and, and, you know, let's be honest, like a lot of the outdoor farmers don't have great systems. And although it's probably much cheaper to grow just inherently because they're outside, it's probably not super dialed in, right? Uh, especially if they're growing in the hills of Humboldt. Um, they don't even have any infrastructure a lot of times. So, well, and that's, and, 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 and I mean, this will be, I will probably get a lot of backlash from the humble homies for when I say this, because they'll tell you that they have, you know, they don't need that tightness of control because of the lack of variability that occurs in a natural setting. The reason why cannabis can bang so hard outdoor is because during, you know, a, 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 fall a summer fall cultivation season in humble it's i mean the average temperature change is like 12 degrees a day right and you get you get 15 16 hours of, of light solid basically clockwork up until like second week of august you know and then it yeah. hits 12 th it's like it's 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 baked in right there's not a yeah. lot of variability that's what cannabis can't put up with is variability it's a naturally equatorial genetic and plant and, and so if we look at how, what sort of environments exist on the equator, I mean, we're right. talking, they're not, high yeah, they're heat. not varying at all. Yeah. Yes. Same and it's high around. heat, it's high humidity, you know? So it's like the, 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 the plant is, is versatile, right? What it doesn't like is rapid swings of temperature mm -hmm. and humidity, you know? Um, and it will force ripen the same way that you deal with like fruits and vegetables. So that was, I mean, that was the, the, the craziest thing at that, that first grow we did in Cali with it's now Lowell farms was I tried, you know, we got through 75,000 square feet of the retrofit of, of the 250 before the full term season came up. But then obviously we were paying for the licensing on the other square footage. So right. we just said, we just said, Fuck it, let's do a bunch of full term. I mean, we'll, we'll crop it. My, you know, young dumb ass thought that, okay, I'll just stagger the planting dates by like two weeks. And then that way I can stagger the harvest dates by two weeks. Cause I don't have the infrastructure to harvest and dry 150,000 right. square feet of full term. So, right. uh, but you were, but you weren't strategizing actual like early and late flowering cultivars. You were just staggering the planting. I was just staggering the planting and it didn't matter because the, you know, that fall changes quick in central California and cannabis will force ripen the moment you get to like sub 50 degrees, basically. You just had some butt. smaller plants and some bigger plants, basically, right? <laughs> and they, yeah. dude, ben, they all <laughs> they all finished in the same like four or five days. Like oh, it, all of them were done. And so, I mean, I had to thank God for California. I just don't, there's like no other state. I don't I think I could pull this off. Like I was lucky enough. I was, had a couple of friends at Driscoll's and they hooked I was going to say up. you're in Salinas, bro. So I think you had to. <laughs> a huge opportunity to pull in some uh, labor oh, quick, dude. you know? 
yeah i mean it was it was amazing we had i had like 200 people there in like three days <laughs> they were just coming in on buses dude and yeah. luckily, working like 10 10 people's worth of work brother i miss i miss the labor pool in california yeah. that's for sure uh but you know they came and i speak i speak enough Span- spanish to be you know dangerous but not deadly and uh we got it done we pulled down like a, I mean, literally do starting at 4 a.m. I had to bring, I had to pull up, I just threw up, you know, steel cable, basically the, the 80 foot runs, the lengths wow. of, of table. And then we were just whole hucking plants, flipping them up, throwing them, throwing up. them on the line. Yeah. And then I was, I was taping the greenhouse just shut with this <laughs> queen. And then I had propane gas heaters just oh, wow. running all night. And I mean, that's the, all, all I could do, you know? Uh, Cause we did. I'm sure that was super compliant too. Oh, <laughs> but Hey, that's the early days, right? Like you do, you look, you either go out of business or you just do what you have to do. And you try to, you know, I think there's a difference between the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. Right. Mm. And, you know, I, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of following the spirit of the law, which ultimately is to me, don't take a bunch of product from the unregulated market and bring it in that's untested and don't take a bunch of product that's meant to be in the regulated market and push it out to the black market, uh, you know, and, and sort of develop an unfair untaxed advantage on that front. But outside of that, there's plenty of little minor things that sometimes, especially in the beginning, I mean, it's different now, but sometimes the States didn't even know their own regulations. So Mm -hmm. it's like, it's a very much interpretation. I completely agree. I mean, when we had, so, I mean, I came down to California and I had to bring all of the genetics with me. I came down with like my desktop computer, like, uh, you know, a week's worth of clothes and like 750 clones <laughs> in custom. Jammed in the back. Dude, I took paper boxes and then I had them all, you know, strained out in cups yeah. with like Clonex solution in there. And then I got custom battery powered like LEDs for the tops of like cabinets. Wow, you know? that's awesome. And then taped them to the top of the box and, you know, sealed the box in and had to, I drove straight from Seattle to Salinas. It's like 14 hour drive, you know, and just didn't stop with the clones, got to the grow, plugged them all. Wow. Then, I mean, I was living, I was living at the grow. I had, we had a, uh, luckily, you know, how Salinas is, you've got, there used to be able to live on farms. That was the thing until, until cannabis came in into California. Um, and you know, that the first, I think month and month or so I had my, my computer, my desk, my, you know, a couple file cabinets and then would work until like seven or eight o'clock at night. And then I, I literally blew up an air mattress where yeah. I would sit at my desk and sleep there and then wake up to bring the team in at 5 a.m., get them started, close the air mattress. And it was just that way for, you know, that first that first month that's to get that grind, first started. Sure. Yeah. It's just that's what it takes. You know, I think that's what it takes. And I think that's what I think if there's anything that is a bummer about, you know, uh, not a bummer, but um, a big difference between the industry now versus then, right, is I think it's I think because that there's, there's so many grows that are built out, so a lot of these assets have been developed and owned and you've been traded hands at this point, that not a lot of people get that experience anymore. Not Which a lot really people. prevents you from appreciating it as much, I think. If you don't have to go through the shit, then you don't appreciate the good times as much. It kind of may be softer if you come into that, right? Which is going back to what you were saying about all the professionals that came in and kind of crashed and burned. I think a lot of that was, you know, obviously, like you said, sort of an underestimation of the differences in cannabis at the time. But also, I think a lot of folks, especially executives that are in established industries and established businesses are really good at running systems, but not necessarily uh, skilled at building those systems. And when you come into a startup, you have to build them, right? And so if you don't have, if you don't know how to build it, then it doesn't matter how skilled you are at running it, you're going to be mm-hmm. flailing. And I, I saw that personally many times, you know, but when we were trying to hire people uh, from other industries, I don't know about you, was that kind of your experience as well? Completely. Um, it's it can be hit or miss too. It's it's so I've seen people who are they could be titans from other spaces, right? And they yeah. come in, and some people are able to just get on the saddle and fucking ride you know and it's right. not a problem for them yeah. other people yeah. really really struggle with exactly what you've talked about right there which is just the unknowns and the risks that you have to be willing to take right yeah um and i i've just i've interacted with countless people even people who are you know beer and wine executives coming in and the lack of compliance or the lack of structure or the rules that you had to be willing to bend 
uh, they just weren't okay with that. They just weren't okay with that, like, even from right. pharma and stuff like that. And so it's just, and I get it. That's fair. It's totally fair. Um, and I think it's okay for guys like you and I who came up into it from such a young age that our risk tolerance was already built in. Right. And for me personally, it's like I fucking grew up trapping before I ever worked in the weed industry. And so, right. you know, that's, that's where I come from. And that, yeah, I mean, for me, it was a little bit more like starting businesses and stuff. Right. So I think either way for, for you is a little bit more specific to the cannabis industry in terms of your risks. For me, it was more just being comfortable in the unknown in general and uh, the the prospect of putting money and time and energy into something and losing it all because you went in the wrong direction. Uh, this is kind of the name of the game. Right. So, but that's what, but that goes back to that whole, like, are you comfortable in that startup environment and building those, those systems, which for me, I love that. Like that's my favorite part of business is actually taking the chaos and starting to put some form to it. Uh, once it's already, once it's already good, I'm, kind of like all right it gets a little boring <laughs> it gets a little yeah. i mean don't yeah, get me yeah, wrong yeah. man like as as a cultivator there's nothing i love more than a grow that hums right and yes it's like it's boring but what that, that's what i that's what we're working for it's what we live for it here right. and very seldom does it happen right you know like I, if you look at the major msos across the country they are struggling to hit 50 grams of foot flower and pop what do you think that is out of curiosity operational inconsistency and lack of ownership of of knowledge at the top i mean and again this isn't a hit on anybody that i i don't envy any of these guys who have who have raised 450 million and they're trying to manage 150 stores in 12 states right like it's a monster task they also did that to themselves right and i can't tell you how many of these how many of these C-suite groups I I know and have been to dinner with and have gotten to know or worked with intimately, you know, um, and they don't give a fuck about the hardcore knowledge of plants and understanding the industry. I mean, some of I've these guys. I've seen the exact same thing. Same thing. The uh, um, I actually had a conversation with someone at one of the MSOs uh, back, you know, maybe two or three years ago. I like to call them pubcos now because there's like. I mean, you guys are an MSO, right? At this point. Yep. So yep. yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying to like hammer that into my own brain and, and hopefully mm-hmm. get other folks on the, on the bandwagon, but it was the pub cause I, I spoke to a gentleman uh, that was sort of at the top of the operations at one of them. And I asked, I was like, I, I toured the facility and I said, um, Hey, I noticed you don't really have anybody here at, at least at a high level. That's kind of from cannabis. And I had just transitioned from California. So as you know, West coast and, and Midwest where I'm at now, totally different ball game, right? Like West coast, almost all legacy business owners transitioning over as sort of the big companies, um, in the West or sorry, the Midwest, it's more like the, the wall street guys and, and whatnot. Right. So a different culture from the top, but then I was like, yeah, I don't see any legacy people, um, sort of at, at management levels or even like an advisory kind of independent contributor roles. And I was told exactly what you just said. I was like, well, they don't really have anything to offer. Um, I mean, they can come in and work entry level if they want, but like, we don't see value in, I guess what you'd call knowledge. And I was just thinking that's crazy because they have, you know, and I speak in generalities here, but in general, like the people that have been in the game for 20 years, probably understand a little bit more about what people are looking for and you know, at least from that perspective. And then there's also, you know, unique qualities to the plant that even if you have a horticulture background or an agriculture background, there's still learned lessons you're going to have to learn along the way. And if you have someone that understands the intricacies of cannabis, they can help skip that. Right. So it's, it's a, it's, it's an interesting mindset, I'd say. And I think, uh, holds, holds some folks back maybe if they kind of switch that around. Well, and I'll probably, you know, and I get flack for this, but I think it's the same problem from either side, right? Whether you're, whether you're a a pub co or an MSO, or you're a legacy operator that's struggling, it's operational error from two different angles, right? From the pub co side, you've got, you've got people who are, you know, executively managing the business. They never even kept a house plant alive. They can't, they can't even, they can't even tell when something needs water. Right. right. Okay. Straight brown thumb. <laughs> uh, okay. Right. The other, the opposite side of that is dude can run 
his 16 lighter and grow chalice yeah. winning pot, but right. doesn't know how to use Excel. Right. right. And, and doesn't understand how to extrapolate that to scale maybe as well. And, and build that consistency that he can at the small scale. Won't communicate outside of signal. You know what I mean? And it's like, <laughs> it's like, okay, we've got to figure out a way. To- or his burner phone. Yes. If you're even lucky to talk to yeah. him on a signal at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so it's like, we have to, we have to figure out a way to bring those two worlds together. And that's really what I think I focus on is because I'm, I'm a legacy grower that holds a extremely serious executive leadership role for yeah. one of the larger, you know, businesses in the country right now. And, and like, you don't, you don't get there by staying in the trap forever, right? right? You have to learn how to communicate. You have to learn the jargon. You have to learn the acumen. You have to learn your computer skills, your technical skills. And I think that's what holds, do keep people in Cali are in a, in a bubble. They have, they have no idea what's happening outside of the state, which mm-hmm. there is a lot. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and like, I saw a post from black sticks, you know, earlier today, that was making a claim that, you know, once weed becomes national legal, there's not going to, the only place to grow it is going to be California. And it is such a short, it's like, do you not understand how cheap real estate and utilities are in the rest of the country and labor? Or how about, cost or how about in like South America? Like you want to talk about cheap, like, come on, <laughs> yeah, man. It's, it's like Just saying. wait till it's fully internationally legal. Yeah. It's like we did, I had an opportunity to go do a, 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 a grow in Colombia and it's like we did we did 24 hectares of greenhouse wow. <laughs> for like 22 dollars a foot yeah you know the build I mean? costs are out of control and then the labor costs are out of control All so in. your capex is lower and your opex is lower and it's just it's like anything else i mean i mean ben it was it was all in from yeah. from breaking ground to harvesting it was like 2250 a foot right capex opex and so it's like Look at what happened to the cut flower industry, you know, in the 80s and 90s, right? And that is that's where all of that's where all of that dilapidated greenhouse that is now full of mid-grade weed in California came from. It all mm-hmm. used to be cut flowers. And I don't know if you know, but that that whole industry was subsidized to South America to curb the cocaine production. This was done in the 80s, mm-hmm. right? And and this was this was I, th- I think put into motion in 83, 84. And by 91, the entire cut flower industry collapsed lapsed in the u.s so like all the carnations the roses that you go buy at safeway that used to be grown in the u.s it's not anymore we 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 we, i mean we pay i think almost a billion dollars in shipping tariffs to cover the cost of bringing those flowers up into the up into the you know north North america from south america now and if you don't think that a version of that is going to happen with cannabis you're out to lunch and if you look at the commoditization right especially in biomass perspective right and how much easier it is to go and grow a facility in a greenhouse in south america crop it all mill it turn it into fresh frozen and then you can make great live product especially if people are able to get decent genetics which they are now all over the place yeah and, or, and, or distill it even worse i mean if you're just growing biomass for something you don't care about the terpenes well, good luck because Tasty. they're just going to blanket their land with it and grow it for one tenth the cost. Dude, like hemp, you know? Yes, I mean, I did one. I did one in um, Sri Lanka for the Sri Lankan government, and they they literally, I mean, again, eighty acres. It's all CBD right now, right. but it's an eighty acre facility. All of the employees live and work there, and then they yeah. put they put a. I think it's a MEP 80 capstone CO2 system out there that's capable of producing like 180 keys of distillate a day. And they have export set up with Europe now. And so it's like, uh, what are we talking about? What are we talking right. about? So, right. you know, I, th- I think, um, I think if, if what, what, what businesses and operators need to focus on is excellence, core excellence. I don't care what part of the supply chain you're in. You need to know, how and what you do, you need to be able to do it the best you can, right? And you need to be dedicated and committed to understanding what that means for you. And if it's running mm-hmm. a retail store, it's running a retail store. If it's being a distributor, if it's an extract guy, like, okay, own it, own it, mm-hmm. stay in your lane, be the master of your lane, right? Gain expertise and be able to go super deep because that's the problem with the legacy weed guys is all they know how to do is talk about up smoking backwoods and what za has the best terps you know and all that sort of stuff and they can't could they can't cross that over 
right. you know, into, into, you know, actual operational leadership. So, um, I, yeah, I think, I think, and, and I would love to hear from your perspective too. If, you know, you're like me a Cali transplant, West coast transplant that's come out here. It's been, it's been shocking to me to see how quickly people have built some of the best cannabis assets that I've ever seen out here. Right. Yeah. Well, and I mean, you know, I think people also need to understand that there has been cannabis in other states historically as well. It's not just California. I mean, the Michigan market is a prime oh. example is, you know, got just as uh, developed of a consumer base, right? It's a little bit different in some regards, but it's just as developed, just as passionate. They've got some great operators out there um, and, and elsewhere as well, of course. So yeah, I agree with you. I think I think what we're starting to see now is we're starting to see some of these folks that are under the radar starting to come up to the surface a little bit as the media hype around all the big players that have been capturing all the attention so far. We're starting to see the chinks in the armor there, right? And, you know, the folks in Canada are really hurting. They're kind of a little bit further along that decline, but we're also seeing issues with the big pubcos, many of them. And as, I think as the consumer gets more sophisticated and their tastes change as well what you're saying about being excellent becomes even more relevant because they start realizing things that they like and things that they don't like and the whole mids that label means something to them right because they realize that hey this stuff it's kind of sucks. <laughs> it's not great so why am i going to go spend money on that if i have access to other stuff when you don't have access that's one thing but when you start having access to better stuff especially as it gets more competitive and the prices aren't hugely different, then I don't see why anyone would continue to buy the, the stuff that's lackluster when you've got sort of this better stuff available to you. Dude, and, and I, completely and how that's being generated and then where like nobody consumers want to be able to buy the best flower they can for whatever price they can afford. Okay. They are not concerned with the the infrastructure of the grow you know nobody nobody's coming in and they're like hey was this a, was this a under hps or led <laughs> yeah 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 good point you know call, yeah. Yeah. yeah no no one's like hey did you use um um a dissolved oxygen in your water or did you use eca generation you know like no one's asking those fucking <laughs> questions right so i only I buy think... i only buy weed that was on the second tier of the grow i, I don't <laughs> touch the bottom tier <laughs> i love that yeah exactly exactly yeah yeah and 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 um and i but what is what i think is critical right is being able to as a company understand your processes intimately and be able to convey that to the consumer um and i and i think that is where i think that's the biggest pitfall for some of these pub coasts and some of these bigger businesses is uh, they just frankly don't care about the quality of the flower that's coming out. And because they never did in the beginning, they've been willing to make shortcuts and mm. quality changes. And they, so then they don't want to be transparent with those processes. And they're small yeah. at first, right? They're little right. gives, they're little gives, right? Like, okay, well, we, we've been hand trimming everything, but we're looking at we're looking at the uh, you know the the cogs and the bomb of our tier two tier three products. We're going to start machine trimming all of that because it mm -hmm. makes sense, right? It's yeah. easier, it's faster. We're going to save some labor. We're going to make some more money. Okay, awesome. But now your machine trim weed looks the exact same that everybody else's machine trim weed looks like, and so so now you've lost your product differentiation with it. And I think these are the objective decisions that I think businesses don't have a great way of quantifying or qualifying. Um, and and the feedback loop that comes from the consumer um, is is quick, right? And it's violent, you know? And it's usually, yeah. it can be very negative, you know? Yeah. Um, and then I think kind of the other side of this too, right, is 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 asset creation. This is where I don't, this is where it's like, I, like I, you know, I'll be the first one to talk about how much some of these pub coasts have missed the, missed the boat on understanding cultivation operations but i think it's also dude you, these grows are so expensive they've only gotten more expensive to build like i remember when i first started getting going in 2015 180 200 dollars per foot for an indoor grow was astronomical like i remember saying yeah we just spent 240 and people were like you're out of your fucking mind you overspent <laughs> yeah. try building a good indoor grow in new jersey new york or massachusetts and any of these 
high union states for less than 850 a foot. Go try, go try. Um, and, and it happened in less than 10 years. Okay. So, so if you take that and then you factor in with how expensive it is to build true state of the art facilities, these guys don't raise enough money. They, they, they try to diversify too much capital. They start making value engineered build out decisions, which then limit their ability to do things like increase light output, uh, uh, adjust how they're feeding, right. And control their HVAC and environmentals. Um, and that's where businesses like Good Day and what like part of what I think differentiates us into the future is, is around that asset development and management. You get one shot to come and spend $60 million to come build your flagship facility in New Jersey. If you didn't build that with the ability to turn your light up to 1500 PPFD and with the ability to HVAC and cool that properly, the person who does, who comes along and spends that money the first time, they're going to start outputting your yields by 2x, 3x, while retaining the same flower quality, good freaking luck keeping up yeah. with them long term, yeah. right? And I think that's the big issue I've seen and where it comes, to, again, to not being willing to trust and hold true ownership and, and, and knowledge at the top of the business is then you make these you make these value engineered decisions, you shortchange your own business, you shortchange your own asset development, and that limits your ability to be successful long term and to compete long term with people who do. And so I, I mean, I do straight up, Ben, I think that's one of the biggest differences between Good Day and a lot of the other MSOs right now is all of our facilities are capable of outputting over 1500 PPFD of light, and they're able to cool with that much light going on. That is the difference, right? Is I can push these plants to their absolute max, feed them properly, and then control the VPD in the environments of the room. That's how you put up 85, 90 grams a foot of flour and package product, right? We're doing, we're on average, we're doing 115, 120 grams a foot of biomass across the board. Go find me another MSO that's doing that, please. I, yeah. I would love to know. I would love to know who's out there doing the same thing. And I'm not saying that we've got the cookbook. I'm not saying we've got the recipe or anything. The recipe is freaking light and water and, and building an asset that can control that properly. Right. right. Um, well, I think the recipe is also having a starting point that's good enough to be competitive, but also having that mentality that we're going to continue to uh, seek improvement, gather data and, and, and build those improvements in. Right. Um, because otherwise, if you're stagnant, then again, someone else is going to come in, innovate further, and you're back to square one. You know, especially if we were talking before we got on the recording about uh, some folks that get into these new markets, right? And they all repeat the same mistakes, which is that they project out their uh, sort of financials, assuming like a very, very elevated price point for flour because it's a new market. And so everyone hasn't come in and, and ever, there's competition's not there yet. The price compression hasn't happened, but maybe that provides a lot of like leeway in the beginning to make these types of mistakes you're talking about, like not having a super efficient process because, well, we're selling weed for $3,500 a pound. But then as those other folks come in and the price comes down, that's when you start really seeing the people that are going to be able to survive because the ones that are spending six, seven, eight hundred dollars a pound to grow aren't going to be able to compete with the guys that are spending half that. Dude, I mean, yes. <laughs> <laughs> like if you look at any other CPG manufacturing business space, uh, the at uh, the you know the the adamant uh, 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 addition and and hold to things like lean and five S manufacturing principles, right? And 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 I mean these businesses like shot like they they don't they want to know they want to control how long people have to walk from their workstation to the bathroom and back right <laughs> well and or like, you got amazon they won't even let you go to the bathroom they you carry a bottle around <laughs> <laughs> so and people still work there so right? i think it's uh i i i um I think that's the where and people don't understand that that's coming for cannabis as well and i know i know operators who are still calculating yield by pounds per light right right and they don't they don't understand how archaic that is and frankly i don't have pity for those people who are gonna get eaten and left behind because that's part of the process you have to figure out you can't just you can't just grow good pot anymore it's not good enough you know you grow you good have, and cheap 
you have to grow good and cheap and you have to know how to run a business and you know how to know how to control your costs and you don't have to have to know how to raise money you know um and it's a different ball game and and i think that that's where that's going to be the real challenge um and especially over the next you know five years or so is is going to be you know more and more states are coming online operators are continuing to get better people are continuing to learn you know yeah and if you're not actively thinking about that every day and how to get your you and your business better if you think you have it all figured out for one moment dude sorry but that's it's gonna yeah, be you're being left behind years. yeah yeah 100 percent. that's why i always i'm always wary when i see uh someone with a master grower <laughs> in their title because it's like you know do people still do that shit <laughs> I had a I had a guy at a uh, I won't I won't name names but I had a guy at a one of our facilities come up and I was like I had like the whole grow team with me and I was going deep on like the difference between field capacity and full saturation of a media and like how to calculate it and he like waited me for me to stop and they pulled me aside and he's like hey man just want to let you know that I've got the secret to be able to get you from twenty percent to thirty <laughs> percent THC and I was like oh well what's the secret and he's like well I can't tell you that it's proprietary. <laughs> Yeah. join <laughs> join my patreon it's like it's, he's like he's like yes yeah, i've been referred to as a grandmaster grower and that was the first time Ooh. i ever heard that one was grandmaster level grower. level 47 wizard yeah it's like literally yeah i was i was just i was ta- i was just like ah oh, man the ego in this industry is just i mean it's so, and this is this, this is coming from someone who's got a huge one and came from you know music which is just full of ego you know but i think that's again like i tie everything back to to music because it's just such a big part of my life but i think that's one of the best what i expected myself what i expected of people who are really good at their at their trade is you know the best musicians like they know how to be a solo player and they know how to be an ensemble player and there's there's Mm, two different skill sets to that right yeah and and the best players in the world know how to get to a rehearsal and leave their emotional and ego baggage at the door and show mm-hmm. up and play and be an objective team member, right? Um, and I think those sort of concepts can be applied to anybody in any part of the supply chain in any part of the industry. And if you are willing to be objective and have a yes and sort of mindset, and if you want to bring your skill sets to the table in a productive manner, the, this industry is your oyster. I, mm. I, I don't. I can't think of a better industry for someone who's twenty four to twenty seven, fresh out of college with 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 nothing but passion and time. You know, mm. I, to, right. there there is no other industry where you could come and quickly make six figures a year, right? Without having to have a bunch of schooling and education for it. You know, and grow, growing up the ladder for decades. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and and having to spend de- and having to spend years at a business or something like that, just freaking grinding every single day. And yeah, there's yeah. a ton of grinding in cannabis too. But I mean, I, I I can't tell you, Ben, how many. This is what I love about being a leader, is being able to find kids, people. I, I I say they're all kids, but a lot of my team members are older than me, you know. And yeah. and that's finding people who are passionate. And like I say this all the time, I lead with my two E's: education and empowerment. I don't believe I'm special. I don't believe I have any sort of unique skill set. I think all I've done is had opportunities to fail and get better, right? And and I've been lucky enough to have a lot of instruction from capable people and smart people to help mentor me to get through those issues, right? And I and I think with the right support and training from from leadership and from management, anybody can be a fantastic operator in any part of your supply chain. And that's been the problem is you got a lot of leaders who sure they, they, they might be titans of other industry, but when was the last time that they were a manager training someone on something? It's probably been a decade, right? Yeah. Right. That's a good point. Yeah. So they kind of forgot the smaller scale stuff because they've been at such a high scale. Exactly. But then the opposite problem of that is cannabis is just attracts a litany of like 21 to 25 year olds with probably not a lot of secondary education. And I like, I can't tell you how many kids I've given their first leadership role to ever been ever. And yeah. as someone who grew up playing super serious sports, you know, played music at a high level, like I I've been, I I'd had a lot of leadership practice before I got into the professional world and, you know, had opportunities to build that skill up. A lot of these kids don't, you know, they're coming out of high school. They didn't have a lot of opportunities. Maybe they're not coming from the best family life, but they, they're extremely passionate about cannabis. They would do anything 
to be making 24 bucks an hour and to, you know, have that lead title. Yeah. And, and that's the opportunity you look for and, and, but you give that to them, but then you have to, you have to build them up entirely. Um, right. and, and it's that same challenge of where it's like someone who's, who's got a ton of experience, but has been out of the saddle for a long time versus someone who has no experience, but they're forcibly in the saddle now, you know, <laughs> and yeah. like, again, you're trying to bring, you're trying to bring those two worlds together. And so like, I, I, I think like my whole job is, is to be able to lead with the why, right. And yep. I, I don't have a horticulture degree. Um, you know, I've, I've had to, all of this were like questions I didn't know the answer for, mm -hmm. and I needed to go figure it out so that I could, I could teach and, and lead my team properly. Um, um, and, and, and I think that that's gotta be the mentality for anybody who wants to be a serious leader in this space. You can't, you can't say it's okay to say, I don't know. Right. Yeah. But you can't leave it there. Right. Right. And I think that's, I think that's what happens is you've got a lot of people in this space who are like very much okay with collecting a big paycheck. Um, mm -hmm. And they're not really trying to do the work to own that position at a high level and to be able to help take that role and that position to the next level. So uh, it's kind of funny because as you say this, I almost wonder if that particular uh, response like epitomizes the difference between the legacy market and like, we'll call it the quote unquote Chad market, right? The legacy market will never say, I don't know, even when they don't know. And then the quote unquote Chad market will just say, I don't know and not find the answer. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> that's, you that's funny. It. That's funny. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, we got to get to the, uh, the sort of standard question I asked, but before that, I wanted to return to um, the, something you were talking about at the beginning about finding legitimate opportunities and how to sort of weed through the, you know, how do you mitigate the risk of uh, getting involved with something that's maybe not ideal? What's what's your take on that? I mean, this is tough, right? Because there's a part of me that is like you, like as, as people, as humans, it's critical that we develop skill sets to be able to understand what people's real intentions are. And mm -hmm. that can either be done by inferring uh, it with their attitude or how they treat people how they treat their loved ones um, or maybe like simple things of like, do they like animals or not? I mean, I, I hate to say it, but like there's stuff, there's questions that I'll ask people. Like I get, if you don't like pets, you know, that's a, a red flag for me. Right. But, yeah, I agree. And I'm not trying to make it so generalized with that, but I think you have to be able to, as, as, as people, you have to create values for what's important for you. And you have, you can't sacrifice that right? Mm -hmm. You can't bend that because the moment you start bending those values is the moment you start becoming one of those people that you don't want to be, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think what's critical is knowing what you are and aren't okay with from a morality perspective, right? I think it's incredible to understand what you want as an individual, not only out of yourself, but out of your career, right? Um, I can't tell you how many people I've asked that to, and it's the first time a boss has ever asked them. Right. Um, and, and then I think you have, you really, you need to, you need to be true to yourself for those previous two items. You can't be, you can't shortchange it. You can't take shortcuts on that. Um, and I think, I mean, you have worked for some incredible businesses in the space, some of the best, right. We could say, and were they, was it easy? No. Was it, was it always organized? Probably fucking not. Was it super uncomfortable a lot of the time? Yes. Were the optics looking into your business from the outside totally rose colored and you know everyone thought that you guys were, had it all figured out? Absolutely, right? Um, but I think that's a prime example of where like, you know, you've got to, you have to trust yourself. You have to bet on yourself. I think you have to be willing to make sure that you have ways of identifying people you want to be around. And that people you yeah. think you can trust and spend time with, man. I like, it's a really, it's funny because I don't think there's, I, w I wish I had like, look for this, look for this, ask these three questions, you know, and you'll know, but like, but I think your point is, is that you can't have a rule of thumb like that because it is personal. I totally agree with you because I think that people get so blinded by the excitement and the hype, right. And they get so hyped up about, Oh, we're going to make all this money and we're going to be the top in the game and this, that, and the other, that they forget that quintessential thing which is like 
And it's not just people that are working together. It's investors investing in the companies too. Uh, the employees, everybody isn't really looking at, do I actually like these people? Can I see myself being involved with them in a very intimate way for a very long time? Uh, you know, I think people get too tied to the, the outcome that they're looking for that they maybe gloss over some of that stuff. So that's, that's a great takeaway there is you really got to align your core values with the group that you're going in with. Right. I, I firmly believe it. And what's so funny too, though, right. Is I do, I do think there's objective ways to like, again, also going back to music, right. It's that same concept of like, when we show up as a professional orchestra player, you're one of 90 people. You're all there. You all have your individual sheet of music. You're all there to play your piece. You are a part. You are a part of 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 a larger organization. And and being having mastery over that component is is your job, right? Right. Um, and I think where a lot of people in this industry get into trouble is they try to do too much. They try to take on too much. They they start getting into pools that aren't their expertise. It's like we were talking about at the beginning, man. Just like stay in your lane. Yeah. Become a become a master of one thing first, right? right? Before you start trying to to master it all, you know. And like, like how many guys? How many guys do you and I know that were like potheads, and now they're like, oh, I'm going to become a I'm a retail owner now, you know? Right. And it's like, brother, just like just do your thing, you know. Just right. just keep selling weed, you know. Yeah. Um, Can't be the like, best at everything, that's for sure. Well, and then look what happens. These guys, they leverage everything they have, right? All of their own money. They take out two mortgages. They go, they get all the money they can from friends and family, right? They scrape up $8 million to go and get a license. And then they flush it down the fucking drain. And that entire opportunity is gone because yep. they just couldn't have a little patience, a little humility to just yep. like stay, stay in your lane, you know? Um, yeah. Very good advice there. I think is very uh, timely for a lot of folks that are kind of going through that struggle right now. And I'm starting to see people recognizing that maybe we're not the best at this particular thing. And can we find a partner that is better at this uh, and leverage their skill set there so we can focus our energies where we're good at? And I think the more people start to do that, we're going to see a lot of decoupling of some of this vertical integration, which, you know, I've always said that I think. Uh, at least in the markets I've been in, I think that vertical integration served a purpose uh, and, and in some ways still does to a certain degree. But I do believe that that uh, advantage decreases over time to a point where there will be, I mean, there's a reason why the other industries aren't vertically integrated. It's, it's a, there's a huge cost to it, right? And it's impossible to be excellent at everything. Um, and so once you don't need to do that to survive, Anyone who's still doing that, not because they were doing it to survive, but because they can't have the discipline to say, we'll do this one thing that we're good at and forego these other things, they're really going to suffer uh, if they're not already, right? Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree, man. Um, let's get into the standard four questions that I ask everybody. Uh, yeah. First one is, what is your favorite business book? Oh man, I saw this and I was trying to get it down to one. I got it down to a couple. I mean, I got that's it. Okay. That's the, the first one. And I, well, this will always be a favorite is rich dad, poor dad. Um, yep. you know, that was, that was one of the first business books I read. I think my dad gave that to me when I was a freshman in high school and it's always, always stuck with me. Um, one of the more recent ones that I've read that I'm a huge fan of is zero to one by Peter. Oh, yep. I'm reading that right now, actually. Are you? Oh, yeah. Dear. yeah. Oh, some great, great, great great information in there. Um, yeah. and just, I mean, yeah, yeah. It's just, and he's such a smart guy. He has such a good way of synthesizing extremely complicated concepts. And and what I love about, and then, sorry, the third one I'll say is dare to lead by Brene Brown. I don't know if you've read that one yet. Yep. Uh, but it's very, very good. I think those are three, those are three that I suggest to everybody. They go read like right now, get them on audiobooks. You can do their short, you know, you could probably do it in right. traffic from Sacramento to, <laughs> you know, back to San Francisco. So, uh, um, but anywhere uh, five miles away in California. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, um, but those are big ones. And I think, um, Part of what I, again, like as a senior leader, what I think a component of my job is, is like I said a second ago, is being able to, uh, it's coaching, right? Being mm -hmm. able to take extremely complicated topics, synthesize them down into like a one-liner, you know, that you could repeat easy and embed into people's brain. Like Coach K, yeah. the reason why he's fucking <laughs> Coach K is because he can, you know, he can correct people's jump shot with three or four words and touching yeah. your elbow and your hip. 
you know, and then it's life changing. Yeah, exactly. Life changing. Okay. So like, that's, that's what I think we have to be focused on as leaders is like, how do we get, how do we get people up to speed the same way that we are without having 10 years of cultivation experience? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. Um, what are your favorite genetics? Oh my gosh. Uh, right now, um, probably menthol collection from compound that's mm. just coming out right now. We are doing some test hunts for them. Um, the pave collection as well yeah. from them is really, really good. Uh, the burger, the Donnie burger line, um, uh, from Tiki is, is, is pretty, is pretty heat. We're popping some of those phenos right now, which I'm really excited about. Um, and then I think probably, you know, it's, I mean, the whole gelato to the lemon, the, uh, uh, uh LCG phase yeah. and, and fad is like, I've, I've had a lot of that flower and don't get me wrong. Like the fruity gas exotics are great. Um, but it's like, all it's been has been like dessert exotics purple like dessert exotics for the last like three years really four years um and i'm still like you know i i, I had all my first success growing og kush blue dream you know triple og Typical like, west coaster <laughs> yeah yeah and so it's it's um uh, i'm excited to get back to that and so i'm yeah, actually yeah. doing some um some really interesting bringing some uh really interesting sfe OG oh. crosses back with a, a node and compound coming from their TC lab, which is really exciting. Um, and and then, you know, uh, bringing back some of the old uh, uh, true sativas. So uh, some super lemon haze crosses are coming back through some super silvers, which I'm really excited about, uh, as well as um, some crosses with the uh, uh, OG Jack cut as well. So, awesome. um, yeah, man, trying to bring back some of the classic like green weed, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, right? It doesn't have to be some crazy neon color. <laughs> I just, it goes back to the, like, I just feel like everyone bitches about the THC obsession. I, you know, it's nothing new, but it's just walking through so many grows and seeing these great genetics and the growers like, well, we're not going to run this again. And you smell it and the nose is amazing. And it looks awesome but they can't run it again because it's 18%, right? And it's like, that is what provides the great high. Like the, the 30 percenters, if they're even that, you know, that's, it's not, it's not where that, where it's at. It's, it's the terpenes and, and everything else. And every, every great experience I've ever had with cannabis, uh, at least from a flower perspective, we weren't, you know, we didn't know what the potency was, right? Which chances are it wasn't. 28, 29, 30%. So all these classics and stuff that I feel like people want to want them, but the growers don't feel inclined to grow them because the shops won't buy them because, you know, it's just like this whole domino effect. And we've got to figure out well, how to unravel that. Oh, dude. And I, I mean, this is like you talked about, right? This is where there is a bit of a gift with being vertical, right? So like good day, yes, we have, point, right? you know, we have 74 retail doors. I don't like, oh, we don't, oh, 93, I think 90, over 90% 90 of what we grow in most of our markets is, is just getting sold through those retail doors. I can grow yeah. whatever I want, yeah. right? Right. Right. And then right. we have a good, better, best. You have the narrative. Exactly. We get, we get to control that sell through and control that story. So that's, that's actually huge for us. And, but it's, it's all about new news. Like Ben, I'm growing over 60 unique cultivars in every one of these grows. And I will rotate out all right. 60 every year. Right. Yeah. So Otherwise, the novelty wears off, and then the entire purpose of the exotic—it's only exotic if it's exotic. And so, exactly. they, that, yeah, I, I love the rotation uh, concept. I think having like some core uh, strains that you're known for that aren't in the exotic category, but they're just like the the bread and butter, right? And bangers. You grow them so well because you've been growing them nonstop year after year after year. No one else could compete on those. And then you have that layer of the. The, the new drops constantly coming in, you might bring something back again, but it, yet they haven't seen it for, you know, half a year or something or a whole year. And so that way you're keeping that, that freshness. I love what you guys are talking about working with compound and note on doing a bunch of uh, new hunts and, and new breeding uh, experiments and stuff, because I think that creativity and that innovation, you're not going in and breeding it yourself. This is the key, right? You're yep. not doing the breeding program yourself because that's an entirely separate business, but you're doing all the innovation by working hand in hand with the breeding partner so that you're able to bring those innovations to the market. 
And that's the key is folks don't need to feel like they're not going to be able to compete if they use a, a strategic partner. They just need to offload the part that they aren't going to be able to do so that they can focus on the part they're doing and they just work together. It's collaboration. And that's that's the future, right? Best in breed, right? And here's the thing too, right? Like, and I've and I this is what my job is. I've spent, I've spent I spend hours researching, going through who the best genetic partners are to work with. And I'll tell you right now, the 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 three leaders are Conception Nurseries mm -hmm. with Kevin Brooks and Tani. You've got Purple City Genetics out of Oakland with Melanie yep. and Aaron, who are just yep. great. And then Node and Compound with Felipe and Lauren and Dan. And, Dan, and, yep. and they are in their two, their three, they're solving the same, the same problem from three different approaches, right? Conception's the first one to do micropropagation, tissue culture. Mm -hmm which is basically not a lot of genetics, but thousands of cuts at scale that are clean, right? Whereas Node- And permanent is, archive as well. Exactly, and permanent archive. Node is doing meristem breeding, where they're actually separating out and splicing out very small sections of the DNA of the plant, and then over time, raising that into a true clean stock genetic. They're also then able to take that meristem breeding and create new strains from it. Right. Hmm. So they can't create a bunch of clones, but they do have over 400 unique phenos and they're able to produce over a hundred a year. Right? right. So it's, it's so, so like, cause Drit, like if you look at, if like micropropagation is going to be the model, this is how Driscoll's runs it. So Driscoll's does all of the, they, their, their national raspberry collection comes from central California. They have a lab there that's capable of producing over 1.4 million starts a month. Okay. And if you like, if you drive through Salinas, you'll see it. You go by Driscoll's farms. They are cloned. They're delivered in flats and they're in biodegradable test tubes and they're transplanted hmm. by hand wow. on the back of a tractor. Right. Yeah. And that's yeah. what they've done. Driscoll's raspberry is on its 164th phenotype. They control everything, the vertical yeah. height, the horizontal height, yeah. how many nodes it starts, yeah. right? The right. amount of fruit it produces, everything. So, well, and they have to, because you want to talk about like bag appeal in the fruit market, like people will not buy it if there's any yes. flaws whatsoever. So they they have no room for error there. And they've sacrificed everything around flavor, right? To be able to create that and produce that consistently. I don't want cannabis to go there, right? But I do want cannabis to be able to start leveraging that same technology so that we can create better and cleaner and more consistent genetics. That's the problem with genetics right now. That's why I, I run 60 and turn them over every year is mm -hmm. because these genetics are getting bred so quickly and mm -hmm. they're usually only refined to maybe an F2 or an F3. And so they're still very much- uh, A lot uh, of variety. Uh, they're affected by environments. So even if you, you know, have a, a breeder's cut, you know, or whatever, yeah. that every mom that you take from that, every subsequent clone that you take from that is degrading over time. Mm -hmm. And then you have oh, just differences, right? So it's like, yeah. that's the problem, right? You know, that's what's so difficult is it's like, yeah, you, it's blue dream, but there's so many different versions of that. And it's gotten so far away from the original that was bred eight, 10 years ago. Right. Um, and so I'm a big believer. I think TC is going to be a, a, a foundational requirement for businesses who, who want to innovate in the future. I think, I think understanding how to retain and clean and produce clean stock genetics. Again, it's going to be the differentiator for MSOs over the next five years. I will say, well, look at, look at California and the hop latent issues right now. What, I think I just read something that said 80%. I mean, and that's probably, I can't imagine that that's accurate, but still the port, the point is there's a, there's a ton of, uh, you know, infection, right. And, my understanding, I'm not an expert. My understanding is tissue culture is a great way to sort of clean genetics like that up, right? And restart yourself in a, in a clean environment so you're not suffering from all that. But it takes forever, dude. Yeah. It's like, it's to, you know, just to, it's a, to get a clean stock, it's a nine to 14 month program. Yeah. And, and you know how many other new genetics I can just go buy in nine right. to 14 months? So, like, what's the point of even holding? That's the problem, right? right. Is that TC is such a buzzword right now that, like, I don't want to, I don't want to save any genetics. What, why? Maybe if you had like, I mean, I suppose if, you know, if you, if you have sort of the quintessential cut that you're known for, right. Like the wonder yeah. bread OG or something like maybe that's, you know, there's some, there's some actual one. value, <laughs> you know, like, and that's, Fair. and that's, Fair. and that's, I mean, it's, I guess the thing I, I think of is, okay, let's look at, let's say, let's look at the most recognized brand in the world with cookies. 
they are not keeping anything on stock in tissue culture okay right. even the original girl, girl scout cookies isn't being held on ice you know right for you and know, every market preserve. they're in it's completely different flour, totally. you know? it's yeah. completely different flour they're just renaming whatever they can and, I, and i'm not hating on it you know it's like they're they're, they're doing the damn thing right um and the consumers clearly don't care because they're not calling them out uh, so it's it's a uh, yeah, genetics is tough and i think but um yeah big fans of 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 uh big shouts out to compound conception and purple city i think they're incredibly professional groups and there's not a lot of other people you can work with frankly there's not a lot of good nurseries yeah. out there and um but obviously you know the, the full moon genetics canarado dragon flame tiki madman the turp hogs boys jeremy proof um the lemonade team uh, JBZ, you know, Nirvana Seeds, Bezel, like these are all archive, right? These guys are all still just doing it. They've been doing it for 10, 15 years. And so it's, you know, I still think that the the having access to those breeders and you have to go and hunt the seeds. You got to pop them. You got to go yeah. through the pheno. Yeah. I think that's still for me and, and, and at, at Good Day, it's, it's a genetics to cast a wide net model for me. I want any and all options <laughs> um, because the more reps that we can get, the more wins that we're going to get through it. And so to me, like I want the opportunity to look at 200 genetics. Hmm. So if I can look at 200, I know I'm going to get 30 or 40 winners out of that, you know? And, and for your own environment, like you said, because even with the most stable genetics where they've collected a lot of data, which is one thing that I'm pretty impressed with, with some of the breeders you mentioned, um, their operations are just, you know, very well run in that, in that regard. But I still think, you know, they'll even tell you it's like, ultimately you're still going to have to do at least one test run to make sure that this, you know, we, we can only give you kind of like what we expect to happen and we have a pretty high range of confidence, but it's still not a hundred percent, right. Because we haven't done the test in every single possible, you know, different environment with different exact humidity changes and everything else. And so, yeah. I agree with you that doing a little bit of local testing is never a bad thing. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're doing third stage testing now for all of our genetic relationships with compound and cookies because we run such high light. Again, mm. we run, I yeah. run a 90% of my flowering cycle at 1500 PPFD, which is basically the top, top of the range before you just run the risk of cooking your plants. We basically mm. are cooking our plants. It's, it's, I mean, it's, I'm right on that line. My average leaf temp is like, 81 82 degrees mm. for most of the flower cycle which is warm right but that's also it's 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 drought stress it's light and drought stress is how you that, that's that's how the plant generates tack it's how it generates terpene right is mm. by is by basically thinking it's dying all the time you know yeah. uh and jamming it with light and a lot of people you know will push back and say oh dude you know that's that's way too much light for the cannabis <laughs> plant how much do you think the sun puts out on a beautiful clear sky, you know, in the middle yeah. of summer, it's 3000 PPFD. It's yeah, twice yeah. as much light as I'm giving the right. plant. And it doesn't fry the plant because, you know, those concentrated UV spectrums are getting filtered by the atmosphere. They're bouncing all around and it's not, it's not pure. What, what affects the plant is you've got LEDs that are emitting purified spectrums of light, which the plants aren't used to absorbing. Right. And that's how you cook them at like 1400, 1500. Right. Hmm. But assuming you can balance that, you balance that with feed, you balance that with the right CFM of air moving across the stomata and you're able to encourage that transpiration effect, keep the plant cooling. Right. You can really, you can really drive these plants. And what we have to do then is, is then run run them a second or third time under our set points, because that's where you cause herms are is generally in, 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 over, you know, over lighting. And that's the biggest issue I've seen when we're getting new genetics is, is uh, uh, we get them under our set points for the first time. And they just, they, the plants are not ready for it. And that's okay. I yeah. don't, you know, not every genetic is going to be ready for what we want to run them under. Well, cause you but, guys are doing something unique. So it's to be expected. So then you're, so if I understand you guys are running those extra rounds to sort of weed out the herms and make sure that you're keeping the ones that are able to stay stable with your increased light uh, capacity and everything. You got it, man. I need the marathon runners, not the sprinters. Yeah. You know, I yep. need I need the girls that are going to be ready for the long haul and they're ready to put up with that sort of stress. It's not going to be it's 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 generally probably five out of ten mm -hmm. that are it's about a fifty percent runway, but the fifty percent that make it through. It's like, it's like seal team. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like these ladies, are, <laughs> these ladies are ready to put up with it. So <laughs> that's awesome. Um, next question. What, uh, what are your interests and hobbies other than cannabis? Oh, that's a good question. Um, uh, I still play music uh, from time to time and practice. I actually got my practice pad right here. underneath. You didn't the, uh, mention what you play. What, what specifically is your instrument? 
I was a, a, a classical percussionist, but obviously drum set player. That's what okay. I started on was playing drum set. Uh, Not the cymbals. <laughs> I, can play, dude, I can play his crash cymbals, dude. Absolutely. Uh, uh, in fact, it was so funny. I was just um, uh, with some friends. that were, uh, I was back in Seattle this weekend and saw Blink-182 uh, for their world nice. tour, which was epic, dude. It was such a good show. Tom, Tom back, oh, you know, Tom is back. Uh, but I was hanging out with all of my musician friends and, um, you know, we listened to some classical music and I still remembered the crash symbol expert excerpt from Tchaikovsky <laughs> from years ago, but, uh, uh, play music. Uh, I mean, honestly, man, work out, got to work out. I don't know how yeah. I, I mean, I love it. I mean, you're fucking jacked. I can tell and love that and can tell you hit the gym, which is important. But I think for anybody that's in our space, dude. These people yeah. who are like, we're all working 60, 70 hours a week. I literally, I, I know it's probably insane to say it, but I think of myself as a high performance athlete. Like mm-hmm. I have to be able to put out high quality work, 10 to 12 hours a day, at least five days a week. And if I'm not yeah. taking, if I'm not eating energy. right, totally got to eat yeah. right, got to sleep right, got to uh, uh, exercise properly, got to go to the gym. <clears throat> so that that's a lot of my hobby is making sure that I'm preparing myself and taking care of myself so I can continue to operate at a high level and be there for my team and my colleagues. Um, so Jim, yeah, that's great. Yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's pretty much my hangout. I try to be a good boyfriend and not a dog, but it's all I do, man. I love the work. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's funny. I've been hearing a lot of that <clears throat> as I've been asking that question. It's like, well, here's what I used to like to do, but now, <laughs> now I'm working. Uh, last question for you. Where can we find you and your business? Um, are you guys on LinkedIn? website, et cetera. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, you can find me personally at Mikey Towie on Instagram. Also, please check out, uh, my podcast, uh, to the two dabs pod. I think we'll probably have you on as a guest here That'd as well in a couple of weeks, which would be awesome. Yeah. Um, but we're on everywhere that you can find a podcast, uh, Spotify, Apple music. You can also check out our Instagram, um, at two dabs, uh, and then, uh, check out good day farms and codes cannabis on Instagram as well. And on LinkedIn, um, uh, good day farms official is our Instagram. And then, uh, codes Missouri is our, uh, 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 Instagram for that business. So we good day farm is a, essentially I work for the private equity business and we hold, you know, uh, assets and holdings in each of these States. And so hmm. we're a multi-state operator, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, Missouri, Missouri is our, our biggest state for us by far where I have three total cultivation sites in there with a fourth on the way. With an additional fifth production site. So, you know, I have over 120,000 square feet of canopy there, um, a team of about 250. Um, and, you know, we're on track to produce over 5,000 pounds for the month of June right. in Missouri there. So, um, yeah, man, I mean, it's, and I'm just loving it, just loving it up there. And, and uh, you know, yeah, so keep your eyes peeled for Good Day Farm Flower, um, Codes Flower as well. And, um, you know, go check out our pod and, Appreciate you having me on, man. Absolutely. And I will put all those links into the show notes as well. Uh, so people can find you and Mikey. Awesome chatting with you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ben. Really appreciate it, man. <laughs>